Hello, everybody, and welcome to Career Diaries by Elamed, the podcast dedicated to learning about the inspirational stories of leaders in the medtech industry. Today, I'm super excited to have with me Mr. Eric Vollebrecht. So I, I, I am a little bit starstruck, I have to say, because you are a name in the industry <laughs> and you're um, with, your, with your blog and everything. So maybe you could take a couple of seconds to just introduce yourself to, to the few out there that maybe don't know who you are. Uh, well, of course. Uh, thanks for having me, Elena, in the first place. Uh, kind of starstruck myself as well. <laughs> <laughs> because as we were just discussing you look a lot better than I do today <laughs> about me well I'm Eric um, I'm a lawyer um, some people would call me a consultant but these are usually the people that don't deal with lawyers very much so a lawyer well a lawyer is kind of a consultant I would say a weaponized consultant because we do a lot more than consulting also consulting with uh, gloves off so to speak um, I've been a lawyer for, uh, well, actually, this since February 1998, which is a long time already. Um, and in me, and, and since that time, I've explored a career that um, is in. It started out as a as a, a as a career in European intellectual property. I was actually a trainee at the uh, uh, competition directorate of the European Commission, where I did things with uh, broadcasting rights for Formula One uh, competitions and soccer competitions, which was a lot of fun. But in the end, I I moved to private practice, started doing more and more regulatory work. Then uh, when I ended up in a big law firm, they needed somebody to carry the flag for the life sciences regulatory practice. And that is more or less how I uh, uh, went into, um, went into uh, life sciences regulation. And within that field, there was a really nice niche for medical devices specialization specifically which at the time was something that was very interesting for a lot of people, but which, which nobody really did. And then I had the good luck that in my law firm, uh, we had a very active uh, German office that uh, invested a lot in my practice at the time. So I could really grow a very nice uh, practice. And when I finally uh, went out on my own and set up my own uh, law firm in 2011, I had a fantastic uh, practice already for for fantastic clients that yeah basically all with me went with me from uh, from the big law firm to to my own law firm so it's, it's really funny because I think we have quite similar stories in that sense as well so because I joined a, a, a big recruitment business and was their first person for sciences where I found my little niche in medical devices um, right. but how did so so I'm really interested in that for you when you why did you leave and start up your own practice? And then what would you say are kind of like the main differentiators? Why would somebody want to work with a smaller kind of maybe more niche business that isn't a maybe such a well-known brand versus mm -hmm. one of the big names? Ah, yeah, good question. Because when, 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 I, was, uh, when I was with the big firm, uh, basically um, the kind of, regulatory device practice was a practice that was actually not very interesting for that big firm because there was a big firm that was uh, specialized in banking finance big m a projects so what i did was basically uh yeah small stuff that they didn't understand so that it was also not the kind of thing that you could really have a career with in that firm mm. But what I saw in the market was I, I really liked the practice. I liked the clients. I liked the, the, the practice. But there was no business case for becoming uh, becoming a partner uh, uh, in that firm for me. So I decided, OK, this is something I can do well on my own. I don't need a big team for this, uh, but I do need uh, I do need good experts. So what I did then was I, I, yeah, I looked around for other people that had a complementary practice in life sciences, and I found uh, 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 somebody else that had a very complementary practice. So she was really very much uh, specialized in uh, biopharmaceuticals, 
And then we joined our practices into, uh, into a law firm, started with four people uh, at the time, which was really, really exciting. And, the, and, and of course, I was also quite apprehensive about starting my own firm because, of course, if you come from a big firm, uh, you'll, you'll have had the same experience that they, that they will tell you, like, you are nothing without the yeah. structure <laughs> that we provide, right? Because 100%. You are, exactly. You are just a resource. You're just a cog in the machine. Nobody is interested in you personally. So then when I was, so I was hemming and hawing for a long time. And, and at some point my, uh, my wife said to me like, okay, guy, now you really, you, you need to take some decisions here because I can see it's eating you up from the inside. Mm. And uh, I know that you will do fantastic at whatever you choose, but please make a decision. Um I don't care even if your whole project goes down the drain, if we need to live in a smaller house, I don't care. I want you to, uh, yeah, to, to, to do what you're best at. And what now you're just withering away in this big firm that doesn't appreciate you. And we can do with uh, less money if that's, uh, if that's uh, ever a problem. So take a decision. So your uh, wife cat- catalyzed it almost. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah. 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 And that's, um, so then, then, then what I did was I, 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 I took a look at my 10 biggest clients uh, within the devices practice at that firm. And I decided, uh, okay, then I just, uh, I, I, I also took a look at my own contract, of course. And at the time I had negotiated the contract without, uh, without a non-competition clause and even uh, not with a relationship clause in it. I had one month termination. So basically, I could just call these clients uh, and and tell and tell them like, well, I'm planning to uh, to start my own firm. Would you go with me? And every single one of them asked me just two questions. First question: Will you do the same at your new firm? I said yes. They said, Will you cost less? I said yes. And they said, Okay, no brainer. And then, uh, yeah. So then, then I basically I had my whole business plan covered. I gave notice and the rest is history. All the clients went with me and I started out with, with a good core practice and that has just grown ever since. So what I found in this kind of practice is that that niche practice really counts because what my clients like is that with this really detailed regulation that they don't have to explain everything uh, twice and especially that uh, they're not paying for your learning experience because Mm. what you see a lot with these these bigger firms that are not specialists is that uh, a client ends up paying quite a lot of money for educating uh, the persons at uh, at the law firm yeah which which is i mean it will be the same on your end because if you do not exactly if you don't know if you don't know who's who in the business then you spend so much time uh, that yeah, needs to needs to be paid for it one way or the other, and and we have the same uh, same in law, and that's why clients like uh, like to work with me. And also, I invest a lot of time in developing uh, my knowledge. Yeah, you you mentioned the blog, which takes me quite a lot of time to write. At the moment, I'm I'm writing uh, writing a huge work of a completely annotated line by line version of the MDR and the IVDR. Oh wow! Which I hope to publish uh, somewhere this year, and these are all things that yeah I invest in. So I really keep my no- uh, I go to a lot of conferences, so I really keep my knowledge. Uh, uh, I, I I contribute a lot to uh, to to initiatives in MedTech Europe, so I really keep my knowledge at at a very high level, and that is what clients know, and that's what they like to pay for. And, and whether I'm big or small, the only uh, yeah the only ever considerations that clients have when it comes to size is uh whether i have enough bandwidth to actually do the work yeah but it's it's not that they would like a bigger firm or a bigger name actually i find that usually the 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 bigger names are yeah that for for competition it doesn't really matter in the dutch market for example i would consider hogan lovells one of my competitors if you would say that to hogan lovells they would just laugh their head off but uh, 
I could kick their ass any day in court. <laughs> Hogan Lovells, if you're listening. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, it's, it's definitely, it's, it's very similar kind of with, with recruitment as well. And, and, and that thing about talking about essentially the client and ends up paying for the learning experience. It's the same. If you use the generalist yeah. agency, you know, if you use a generalist agency to fill a very specific type of role at a certain point, that recruiter has to, first of all, identify like who's who in the industry then how can I get in contact with them and, and build a relationship before I can even start talking to them about roles? So it's exactly the same. When you're when you're smaller, you're more nimble, but you're also better networked. You're able to hit the ground faster. So yeah. I think niche is always best, at least in my opinion. So <laughs> we're yeah. totally aligned on that. Um, for, for my part, for example, as, as a law firm, we often deal with recruiters as well. And I would never consider working with a not specialized recruiter in this yeah. field. Yeah, totally. And um, so ju- let's just rewind for a minute because I, I've noticed in recruitment a trend of people really starting, and I think it's because of MDR and IVDR creating such a, a nice environment where there's plenty of work. People that are in permanent positions are starting to think about jumping out and starting their own consultancy or starting mm-hmm. their own business to become, um, that's just you pouring some water. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, Trying to fine. hide it under my desk. <laughs> so so what tips would you give to somebody if they were thinking about starting their own business? Because I think we all go through the same challenges. It doesn't mm-hmm. matter what type of business you set up. What kind of would you say, what would be the main actionable tips you could give someone who's thinking about starting their own business as a consultant? Uh, well, there's, there's uh, 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 as we've just discussed in my case, there's, there's always a process leading up to it. And that process can be years or it can be shorter. But um, yeah, what I can, what, I mean, what I can say is, for example, screw business models. Business models are just, uh, or business plans rather. Business model, of course, you need, but a business plan. I've only made, made one business plan for my law firm ever, and that was invalid within a week. So, okay. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so business plans they have such such relative value. I mean, the only the only business plan that I made for myself was uh, I, I had some general metrics on. Uh, what my fixed costs would be for for a law firm uh, for a law firm uh, uh, on a yearly basis, what my salary would more or less need to be in order to uh, to keep my lifestyle. Yeah, and 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 then I needed okay, I need to make this much turnover. And what you, what I think that people need to realize is that if you go out on your own. Um, it's fantastic. It's incredibly empowering. That's that's for one thing, uh, really, really nice. On the other hand, be prepared to deal with a lot of hassle yourself. Mm-hmm. What like do you mean? For, well, like, for example, you drop your phone uh, in the gutter and your phone dies, then no, but it, then normally you would walk to the IT department and say, here, this is broken, uh, get me a new one. And then, of course, uh, if you're in any normal big company, that would still cost you more time net than it would cost you to buy a new phone, which you would do if you're out on your own or have it repaired. But still, uh, a lot of things aren't done for you and you need to do that yourself. So you need to find intelligence ways to do that. Of course, also, there is a, there is a, is a ton of stuff to figure out with regard to pensions, taxes, uh, uh, all that stuff, which is also, it, yeah, it takes more time. So on the one hand, you're going to be in a situation where you will feel under pressure to do a lot of, uh, let's say, billable work. Whereas on the other hand, you'll probably have more administrative hassle at the same time. So, yeah, you need to find a good balance uh, between these things and to... Uh, uh, and to need and and to do that intelligently, you'll need to do some marketing as well. Marketing is always uh, is 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 difficult because you think like, okay, I don't have a budget, which is, for example, uh, uh, compared to oh, let's take Hogan Lovells again. Um, compared to Hogan Lovells, I, I am I am of course I'm an ant, right? I'm just a tiny tiny speck uh, 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 in the market to, to them. So 
if I would go to a conference, then it might be that Hogan Lovells or another big firm uh, sponsors the program, but that will cost you several thousands of euros. So I would never ever do that. I think it's just a waste waste of money. And also you would sponsor the program if you want to show you're there, but you have nothing to say. That's that's basically how I see it. So what I did was when I started my law firm, it's also actually something I won a prize for uh, at the time, uh, a, mark, a law firm marketing prize, is that uh, I, I looked at uh, asymmetrical marketing. Okay. Which is which is a lot like uh, asymmetrical warfare, uh, the way uh, guerrilla fighters do it, is that you think about like how can I get maximum impact with minimal means. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, what I would do is well, for example, my blog. My blog has literally costs me a hundred euros per year in uh, hosting a domain name and that kind of stuff. So it's it's nothing. I mean, I put I put in extra time, but it has an enormous reach. So it's a nice way of doing uh, things uh, asymmetrically. Mm -hmm. Social media, uh, like LinkedIn, for example, like for example, what you did with Element is to start this LinkedIn group. It's a fantastic example, I think, of uh, asymmetrical marketing because you've done very well in curating that group, getting people in, creating a community. Community is also really important. And if you're big, if you're a big firm, it's much more difficult to maintain a community because communities hang uh, from people, yeah, and they don't they don't really hang from uh, from names. Well, maybe to an extent, but still, you need people to manage them and to put in the energy. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, what, coming back to the LinkedIn piece, like how? I mean, obviously, your blog has an amazing reach, and the content that you put out, you know, is is incredible. And I, and just from speaking to people in the market, I know that is so useful for them. Um, mm -hmm. And and that I think is just talking about that asymmetric. What is it? Asymmetric warfare. Asymmetric warfare. Yeah. <laughs> I need to talk to my marketing team about more of that. But um, <laughs> I think for me, it's all about like adding as much value as possible you know, without kind of the hidden agenda, um, mm -hmm. more like put the information out there. And then when people are ready, you'll be at the top of their mind when they need help along those lines. But back to LinkedIn, how important... It's a good... Can, yeah, can go I on. interrupt you there, uh, uh, Elena? Because you make a really good point, And that is that you, uh, you show your expertise and you don't hold back. Yeah. This is, this is how... Clients tell me that they recognize good consultants from bad consultants is that a, a bad consultant will give you a really tiny little bit and then they'll say, ah, but all the rest is valuable know-how. But what I found is if you can do this kind of thing from a position of abundance so mm -hmm. that you treat the knowledge and the expertise that you have as an abundant resource and you give a lot from, uh, from it to people more than others would give uh, um, because there's always more, then this is really what is helpful to clients. And this is also what distinguishes you positively from others. Because if you have that much to give for free, then there must still be a lot uh, uh, behind the paywall as well. But it also it's 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 a batch of you see this is the, I can give you this for free and then there's still more so mm. that, uh, that that is that is really good marketing. Mm. Mm -hmm. Do you know Gary V? Just out of interest, Gary, Gary Vaynerchuk. V. No. Okay, so he's like um, oh, I don't know what you would call him. I don't want to say anything. Um, like a, an influencer, but but really big on kind of like the marketing and the personal branding side, and he mm -hmm. talks a lot about. You, he gives away like 90% of his content for free and people don't use it anyway, you know. Um, but it, but definitely I think giving away um, valuable insights is, is super important, especially for somebody that's trying to start their own company, become a consultant or go out on their own. How important do you think personal brand and LinkedIn is generally as a tool to your success? To my success, it's, it's really important uh, mm. because you need to be top of mind uh, yeah. Right. It's a bit like uh, it's like the Ghostbusters song. Who are you gonna call? Yeah. <laughs> Eric. <laughs> right. 
So that's why, for example, I came up with this, actually, Basil Accra from Tufsuit came up with, uh, for me, he said, yeah, you know, you know, Eric, uh, I know what CE means. It means call Eric. This is brilliant marketing. <laughs> that's great. So I have, I have other people actually uh, think coming up with my, uh, with my marketing thing. So now I use uh, CE as, as call Eric, which is just, I mean, it's, it's very, it's a very easy concept, but it's really yeah. catchy and it works very well. And and of course, yeah, you need to uh, you need to do pers- personal branding as well. So, for example, um, yeah, there's all kinds of ways that you can do uh, that you can do uh, uh, personal uh, personal branding. Of course, I mean, I for example have the crazy stupid gimmick that I basically wear the same tie always ever. It's always the same uh, aquamarine uh, uh, colored tie. Of which I have a whole stack uh, <laughs> because you can buy them <laughs> at a specific store in Brussels by the box more or less. <laughs> but still, it's a nice tie, and people completely recognize me by it. Yeah, and yeah. it's the same. Uh, it's the same tie I wear in my headshot on the law firm uh, uh, on the law firm website, and so on. And it just makes you recognizable. Totally. It's, and, it's and, branding, and, and, yeah. Exactly. And for me, it, it, it goes to the point where I will be at a conference where I'll be the only lawyer in the whole room. And then you have a room of 100, 150 people and they're debating some question. And then the speaker says, let's ask the lawyer. And then it's always me. So, mm-hmm. I mean, that's the kind of publicity you cannot buy. Even no. if I would sink 15,000 euros into sponsoring the program, I would not get that kind of publicity yeah. just by physically being there, asking questions, giving people information, helping them solve their problems, helping them think a particular direction and not being greedy mm. in what I want from them. Not asking like as soon as you want something that is relevant in the least, you need to start paying me because mm. that's just that's just not how it works, I think, uh, yeah. uh, between people. Yeah, totally, totally. And I think um, it, nowadays business is, is really, people, at the end of the day, you know, especially in consulting, in recruitment, in, in these types of industries, it's so much about the people that you're dealing with, you know, and people buy from people at the end of the day. And, and trust is a big thing. And they mm-hmm. have to trust that you're going to be able to deliver, um, that they can trust you with the information. And, and yeah. I think, that that is is so important. I, something I want to talk about now because we've had a really good conversation about like how smooth sailing it was for you. You know, your clients mm-hmm. followed you when you first started up your business, which is really good. Um, but what would you say have been your your major challenges? Major challenges. Well, uh, I would say uh, I, I have two major challenges, so, so to speak. Um, uh, one of it being myself. Okay. Uh, and the other one being the other people. Uh, so. <laughs> okay, you have to explain this to me. <laughs> okay. Well, um, of course, as soon as you begin a law firm, uh, you need people to staff it. Yeah. And as soon uh, as soon as you start dealing with people, then uh, yeah, then then you're dealing with people, and that means that you're dealing with them, and they are dealing with you. Okay. And I think, uh, yeah, I mean, for myself, um, if I would always work by myself, I would be perfectly happy with the way I am. But if I work with other people, then of course they, 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 uh, then, then, uh, yeah, reality, uh, reality kicks in, and you need to be a good employer. You need to be a, you, be, you need to be a nice person to work with. And I can, I can tell you, I, I, I've had to sort out a lot of issues uh, with myself uh, to be a good boss, for example, mm. and to be uh, to be a good employer, and to be a good uh, educator of young lawyers, okay. and to be generally be a good good example. It's just like when you get kids and you and you figure out what it's like to be a parent and to raise children. It's the mm. same thing when you start a company. You need to uh, you need to also change as a person to to be uh, to be a, a good leader for the company, for example. So what did you do? So, 
Well, I did a lot of work on myself because um, actually um, uh, I used to be uh, a hyperactive uh, prankster that uh, really <laughs> likes uh, puzzles. Why am I not surprised? <laughs> which is, of course, perfect if you're just working by yourself, but it's it's less ideal if you uh, have to run a company and, uh, and be a good example. So, yeah, I, 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 I've done a lot of... Um, and it sounds a bit uh, huffy fluffy perhaps, but but a lot of uh, spiritual work on myself mm-hmm. to come to grips with, um, okay, how how am I in relationship to other persons? What is the, what is, uh, what do I take personally from other persons? Like for example, you will be in a situation where the first, for the first time a person leaves the company. Right. And if you're and if you're in a small company, then there might be uh, personal drama involved uh, on both sides. Uh, you might feel uh, if if you, if you're a company of just five people and somebody quits, you might take it very personally. Personally, mm-hmm. and uh, or the other person may 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 also leave for personal reasons that have something to do with you. Mm. And these 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 are things that I that I really had to work on to um, to uh, yeah become um, become um, on the one hand more detached and on the other hand more involved. Mm. So uh, that's that's yeah that's that's been a long uh, long road. And also um, yeah for other for other persons as well of course i mean there are there are some that have been with me from the start yeah, you you grow together and and you grow really close as well um if i so, i was gonna say so when you say spiritual work right yeah. <laughs> what do you mean by that so what exactly is that well of course that's maybe a bit of a maybe a bit of a new age uh, uh term but uh well for example um I've 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 done uh, I've done uh, uh, I'm I'm a very devoted uh, yogi. Uh, okay. So I, I, <laughs> I, I I spend a lot of time uh, uh, in in weird places in weird uh, positions, which for me is a fantastic way to deal with uh, with uh, with the rest with the rest of the world. And it's a bit like uh, probably probably you know the fantastic quote of uh, Jean Paul Sartre, "L'enfer c'est les autres," or, mm-hmm. or the, "The hell it's the others." I mean, in order for me to uh, yeah to be able to deal with the rest, it it I also need my own time. So um, I do yoga and I do scuba diving, and in uh, they're, they're they're both not very social activities. But on the other hand, for me, they 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 balance out everything uh, there is uh, in in terms of um, yeah friction with the rest of the world, so to speak. Um, and it's a good way to quiet down the mind, to be more mindful about uh, uh, about about others. And for example, one of the one of the things that that really worked very well for me in terms of let's say spiritual practice is to also is is to, that that reflected on my management style a lot mm-hmm. is uh, is 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 the is the concept that it's not about me because. Okay. Uh, because in the end, I mean, what am I? I mean, I am, of course, I'm a person that that walks around here, but in the end, it's about, yeah, it, it's not about me as a person. Because so, what do you mean? What do you mean it's well, not about me? If it's your company, if they're I, working for you. Exactly. If I would just, if I would get run over by a bus, I would hope that my company uh, continues because uh-huh. I've equipped them to 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 be able to do that. So my management style, for example, is not centered around, I am the focal point of everything. Everything needs to be run by me. Nothing happens without me knowing. Nothing happens without my explicit permission. What I try to do is to have a management style in which I empower other people as much as possible to do what they are good at and not to uh, put everything not to gear everything towards the result of making me look good mm. externally. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which is which is also, I mean, you sometimes uh, see that uh, with uh, people. So basically, my management style is is geared at uh, making myself superfluous, which is uh, well, it's a lifelong project, I can tell you, because <laughs> <laughs> because it's it, it it's it's hard to become uh, superfluous. But then again, on the other side, I think it's a very a very nice uh, nice ambition because in the end, what you want is you want. Uh, 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 the people that work for you, they are individuals themselves as well with their own goals and their own ambitions. And the only way to keep those people interested in working for you in the long time is to make sure that whatever your firm does and whatever I am is meaningful to them as well. Yeah. Talk to me about well, hiring unicorns. Ah, unicorns, <laughs> yeah. Well, um, my firm is a bit typical in the sense that we 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 call ourselves uh, science-based lawyers. So that means that that in order to distinguish ourselves from other law firms, we also hire lawyers that are uh, that that have technical degrees. So, for example, we have uh, we have a lawyer that's also uh, uh, also a physician. We have a lawyer that's also a biochemist. Which is always really convenient if you want to make nice jokes about uh, how do you calculate uh, what chemicals you need to dissolve a corpse in a bathtub and how long <laughs> would it take? <laughs> Typical lunch uh, subject uh, in my firm. Uh, we have a lawyer that is a biologist. Uh, we have a lawyer that uh, that that is a food technologist and also speaks fluent Mandarin, even okay. though she's not uh, of Chinese uh, Asian origin. So these are really unicorns. Yeah. And in some cases, I would say rainbow farting unicorns, <laughs> special special brand of unicorns. And they are really hard to find these people. And these are often, I found, also people that are not even that motivated by money. Mm, uh, of, course you, of course, you need to pay a, a good salary, definitely. But these are actually also people that I find that are not necessarily motivated by more money. Let's, for example, if you give them more money, they won't work harder. If you give them interesting work, yes, they will work harder. Yeah. And if you stop giving them interesting work, they are gone. Yeah. So, first of all, well, when you're in a unicorn business like I am, uh, unicorns are hard to find. They are, I found, I find. Yeah, not not necessarily difficult to keep because we have really interesting work. Uh, we attract interesting work just precisely because we have unicorns. But they are uh, fickle creatures, mm-hmm. so you need to uh, yeah you need to spend a lot of time uh, monitoring whether they're happy. Because what I typically find is that uh, people that are um, very intelligent, very focused, very dedicated, tend to forget themselves. Mm-hmm. So they, 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 uh, when they're unhappy or when things are not not going well, they will they will do their best to make it work, even though the signs are on the wall already that that they're not feeling well. Mm-hmm. And I think for me, as as a as a good employer, my business is to spot that before it becomes a problem for them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that means that, uh, yeah, you have to spend a lot of time uh, uh, talking to your unicorns, uh, making sure that you understand what's important to them, and and also never treat them uh, uh, with a uh, one-size-fits-all approach. Mm. And also make sure that as as any any animal, I mean, if you look at at, at a zoo, for example, Every animal wants a nice place to stay, right? So, for example, uh, in my firm, we do not do these terrible open plan offices of which it's already scientifically proven that it's just it it hurts people uh, psychologically and it decreases productivity. So, for example, in, in my firm, we have the policy, you can pick your own computer. Anything? Anything. Okay. If, you want a, if you want a MacBook, you get a MacBook. If you want a, uh, if you want an Asus Yoga uh, foldback, whatever, and you get that. 
if you want, uh, do you want an iPhone? You get an iPhone. You want an iPhone Pro? No problem. Uh, what I've found is that um, it is the costs of non-standard devices is insignificant compared to the joy and loyalty it brings uh, to people. It's interesting because like, <clears throat> so a lot of tech companies, this hasn't hit medtech yet, but what we're mm -hmm. seeing with a lot of tech companies, you know, the big, the big ones, um, just stuff like holidays, vacation, right? It's mm -hmm. becoming more and more common. And I'm even seeing it in the UK um, where people just offer unlimited vacation. Right. Right. It's it's a psychological thing as well because actually people don't really end up taking that much more vacation but the feeling of freedom that they have by having unlimited vacation mm -hmm. is just like such a, a an added benefit for the employee that it, it generates that extra level of loyalty um and um what they found is that when you have when you give people say 20 or 30 days vacation, they count their days. Whereas mm -hmm. when you kind of say, Hey, it's unlimited, take as much as you want. They found that people take a similar amount, but they feel like they have more ownership over when and how they can take it and how much they can take. Um, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a similar philosophy. I think as saying, Hey, get your, whatever laptop you want, right. In the end, the cost of the business yeah. is not as big, but what it no. gives them in feeling is, is is much more significant yeah no and i think uh, I th it's it's kind of funny because that ties in into other things that we do in the firm as well like for example compared to other firms we don't have a target in billable hours yeah we just don't and uh, um, because some people are more comfortable uh, racking up uh, bill billable hours and others are better at business development, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what we also don't have is we also don't have a mandatory amount of hours that you need to be seen in the office. So we, we, have, uh, we have very good uh, uh, teleworking uh, facilities. And if you want to work from home, we have a lot of people that, that if they really want to get stuff done, they just stay home. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and uh, um, also, um, people can renegotiate their uh, compensation package by the year. Mm -hmm. So, if they okay, say, so okay, how do you how do you handle that? Because I'm guessing that every year some people will say, okay, I want more money. So, uh, well, that can be part of it, but usually, actually, uh, I I found that people come with really reasonable demand. Or, yeah. or reasonable, reasonable. Uh, well, not even demands, but just reasonable proposals. And if you monitor what happens to your people over the year, then you're never surprised by things. I find. Yeah. So, for example, um, I had a, I, I had several people that started out on a contract uh, where uh, I would uh, compensate them additionally for a billable hours above a particular amount of billable hours, which was a nice way to make a lot of extra money if you want it. I had two people say, uh, well, this is nice, but we would like to uh, change this. We would rather have a uh, a fixed amount per year, which is rather a lot lower than the amount we could theoretically make by working a lot extra because we like the security of having a fixed amount. Okay, so no problem. So now, well, you discuss it and you say, yeah, you know, but actually the, the billable amount that you made this year entitles you to more money that you're asking for at the moment. Are you okay with that? Because I don't want you to cheat you out of money. And they would say, yes, yes, I think I value the security more than uh, than this. So as long as you're transparent with each other, then, then yeah, that's what you can do. I yeah. mean, also what I do is um, I take, uh, I don't take time of my people for granted. So if I have people that work through the weekend to get something done, I will tell them uh, take two days off during the week compensate for it yeah it's important i think to 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 stay close to your people and to and to and to show appreciation i guess right well and there's 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 also nothing worse than having uh, having an employee uh in a burnout scenario yeah yeah totally did you ever have one uh fortunately not no 
Okay. I think so. So coming back to kind of like your career, because it's obviously a fascinating story, I have to say, who who has been the most influential person to date in your career, would you say? Uh, well, that's 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 a difficult uh, question. I think um, there are several. Um, I would say uh, to just put a spiritual spin on it again, because yogi as I am, I would say everybody everybody can be your guru, okay. right? <laughs> and the guru always shows up in the weirdest ways. So I would say there are several people that that really uh, that that some gave my career small nudges, yeah, and others gave it a big nudge. Um, let's see. I think um, well, um, I think one of the persons that really did a lot for me was uh, Ulf Bernitz professor at Stockholm's University when I was doing my uh, my LLM in uh, European law there at the time. Uh, I think that guy uh, did so much for me because he could, he was a very calm, very reasoned guy and he could see the sort of complete undirected supernova of energy that I was at the time and he could just say like okay Eric take it easy direct your energy at this and I direct your energy at that now do this now do that and uh, uh, I was very intent on uh, pursuing a career in European law at the time when I did the uh, the LLM um, Sweden had just joined the uh, the European Union, and uh, and he was very very in touch with uh, the Swedes in Brussels, and he really helped me a lot to get a good position as a trainee in Brussels, which which was a very very important step in my uh, career. Uh, I would say another person that helped me a lot was the uh, was the partner at the. Dusseldorf office uh, at Clifford Chance at the time when I worked at uh, Clifford Chance that needed somebody to carry the flag for the life sciences practice in Amsterdam, mm -hmm. Peter Dieners, and um, uh, he did a lot for me in investing in the uh, uh, in in my practice. He pulled a lot of strings, I think. Uh, of course, you never find out what really happened in the background, but he pulled a lot of strings, I think, in the background to uh, uh, get the Amsterdam office to free me up for that work, uh, to be more patient with me than they should have ever been. Uh, and um, yeah, to get this practice going uh, that way. And I remember also that he was generally devastated uh, 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 when I left the, the firm because he invested a lot of me. Uh, mm. And I, I, I felt bad about that at the time. So he's also a guy, I think, that, and he was also at that time in Europe, he was one of the, um, of the let's say, first real devices lawyers. That really? was famous or, or well known for being an a legal expert in, uh, in in medical devices law and i think he was uh, yeah kind of an example uh, for me and then as as you go there are also the people that are sort of i would say examples without doing anything for you than just being examples people that mm -hmm. are i think are inspirational who inspires you uh well uh, some of my competitors, uh, oh, really? I would say, are, are are big inspirations. Yeah, like for example, uh, Peter Bogaert uh, uh, of Covington and Burling in Brussels. He is uh, he is one of the most intelligent guys I know in life sciences uh, regulation. And uh, even though I don't deal with him a lot directly, we meet occasionally. We have nice discussions, uh, but I I, I see. I, I see his work sometimes uh, uh, indirectly in cases, or I see it in public, and I 
neck like yeah that guy really knows what he's talking about so uh he's he's a bit older than me uh he's also um a few steps further in his uh, career uh, than I am, and he's the kind of person of which I think, okay, well, this is this is a fantastic uh, guy to model. Of course, the way these things go is that, of course, all these people are also persons themselves, and mm -hmm. they have their own good points, they have their own bad points. Maybe maybe people that work for them will say, well, like these these are impossible people to work for. Who knows? Yeah, I mean, that's it's it's whatever person you use as example it's there that example is always in a different context than the context they are in when they do their own work but mm. yeah so there's there's always uh, people uh, people to uh, to learn things from but i also learn things from other people like I remember I was on my way to yoga class. I was in a big hurry, and then I uh, then I uh, then I, I made a mistake. I fell down with my bicycle, and there was this 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 small lady, a small old lady, standing next to me, and she's just like, "Yeah, yeah, that's what you get if you're in such a hurry. It's just, <laughs> it's just stupid. What are you, what were you thinking?" And I think like, "Yeah, you are completely right, old lady." Thanks for being it's, my guru today. It's crazy what little old ladies can can teach you. I have to say, I've learned so really? many lessons from my grandma and her yeah, stick. Exactly. <laughs> so I would say, wisdom and examples are all around. But yeah. You just have to, uh, yeah, you have to keep your your eyes and your heart open to uh, to receive them. Yeah, and be receptive. No, totally. Um, one thing I wanted to touch on because it's something that we um we 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 spoke about in the past is is um. What was it called? The Golden Triangle. Oh, yeah. So talk to me about yeah. that. The Golden Triangle. Where did I leave my notes? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah well, the Golden Triangle is a bit of, uh, it's a bit of the way... Uh, um, a bit of the way my own career developed and also the, the, the thing we look for in persons that, that work for us, yeah? because what we would like uh, for, to be effective in our business is that you uh well that people have a legal uh educate education but also that people uh, know regulatory because what i find what i find a lot is that you have lawyers that that know the law they can draft contracts but they can't apply it to a regulatory scenario or they don't know the rules exactly yeah that's for example under the the new medical devices regulation and the in vitro diagnostics regulation there's a new economic operators regime which actually i would say is the most legal uh part of the regulation if you will and this is where i think you can make really make a difference as a lawyer if you understand the regulatory context in which this this new supply chain regulation functions so you also know how to amend the contracts if necessary so that's that's let's say the second second uh, uh second uh point of the, uh, the the golden triangle and then the third one is to actually have technical training to actually understand on the substantive level what the issue is about so, for example, I myself, I come from a family of uh, engineers. My brother is an, uh, uh, is an, is a, a used to work in military artificial intelligence and now is a structural engineer of uh, uh, big offshore uh, equipment. My father is an agricultural engineer and uh, used, to, uh, used to do a lot of um, programming uh, of agricultural uh, systems. So... <clears throat> I've done a lot of hacking and programming uh, myself, so I'm I'm uh, and, and engineering uh, a bit as well. So I I know about that stuff, and that also helps me to understand things like uh, well, cybersecurity, for example. Uh, Big topic. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Designing designing software for security and privacy, but also designing devices. And if you have an engineering and and uh, uh, and, and programming mindset it's also much easier to actually read ISO standards, for example, and IEC standards, because people will ask me like, you're a lawyer, do you read standards? And I say, yes, of course I read standards because standards are actually, the, they're, they're the juicy bits because that's actually where you, um, where you really read how things uh, might work actually. 
And that's that's uh, some people find them really boring, and I I, I think uh, standards are just fantastic because uh, they really yeah tickle the imagination, uh, so to speak. That's the engineer in you. <laughs> that's definitely the engineer in me. Yeah, so that's that's like the third uh, uh, third part you could say of the golden triangle, and this yeah. this this third point can be different for everybody. For example, our biologist uh, in the firm, she gets completely excited by whatever it, whatever lives and can be detected in blood, for example. Whereas our 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 biochemical engineer will uh, will will. Um, We'll get uh, completely uh, happy with uh, with materials uh, science uh, issues uh, and so on. And our, our physician can talk uh, on end about uh, genetic manipulation and all these things. So, well, uh, everybody has something different. We, we have a paralegal now that's also a, a mathematician with a focus on uh, modeling for artificial intelligence. And we have the most fantastic uh, discussions. Yeah. And you're recruiting right now, aren't you? I'm not going to pitch you, but um, for yeah, no, any no, of our I'm listeners out there. Recruiting. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so if, 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 if you're, you're a unicorn, legal, <laughs> if, if you're a unicorn, especially a rainbow farting one, then uh, please let us know. So farting, um, farting or diarrhea. <laughs> um, so um, two two last questions I have for you, actually. So the first mm-hmm. one is, if you could rewind back to Eric at the age of 21. What would you tell yourself different what to do differently? Uh, well, two things. Huh? What would I, th- what would I tell myself, and what would I tell myself to do differently? Yeah. Uh, I think I would tell myself it's going to be all right. Whatever you do, mm-hmm. you will you will always be all right. And what would I do differently? I don't know if I would do a lot differently. It would be, t- t- yeah, whether I would do things differently, it's, there are so many sci-fi movies made about these time travel paradoxes, right? So you travel back in time, you change something, and then you change the future. I don't know if I would do anything different, it would actually change my future. Yeah, it's so interesting, isn't it? Because the where you are now, you are basically a product of the decisions and the experiences that you have made until exactly. now. Um, yeah. And you make one decision differently, it could have changed your entire course. I would isn't say it crazy that, to think? Yeah, there's so many permutations. I mean, it's it's a Buddhist would say every every second, every next second influences the rest of your life so that the permutations are so big i don't really know that's that's why i'm a bit agnostic about going back in time and telling me to do things differently whether first of all whether it would make a difference and second of all yeah i I really don't know if i would have ended up differently yeah i just don't know i mean i myself i'm a quite a firm believer in in um in in karma and the wheel of samsara as it's called okay what's that it's basically the principle that uh, you need to keep re- you need to keep repeating your mistakes until you get it right. So basically, okay. you keep running around in the same hamster wheel of your patterns and your mistakes until you realize what the mistake is, and then you can exit the hamster wheel for that mistake. And that is, I think, that's that's the human condition. Is that you? Yeah, you have to run in your hamster wheel of patterns and mistakes until you. Well, again, oh, that's another mistake solved. Okay, good. It's another burden I'm rid of, and I think that's that's really what life is about: uh, mm. shedding shedding unnecessary uh, patterns. Uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's really interesting. Really interesting concept. Um, taking it at the macro level, because obviously you've kind of taken it there anyway. So the big question that I love to ask everybody that I have. Um, on this podcast is what is the legacy that you want to leave on the world? Ah, the legacy that I want to leave, that I'm superfluous. That you're superfluous? That I'm superfluous, yes. Explain that. that. Well, uh, it's that people will uh, will say, okay, uh, we miss him, but we don't need him anymore. That's a really interesting legacy to want to leave yes why well because um 
because it's um, yeah, of course it's nice that there is that there is something you'll be remembered by, but there's there's always something you will be remembered by, and 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 and, and if if I'm gone, then I have no interest in being remembered by anything anymore anyway. So it's it's. Yeah, I don't, I'm not really working on leaving a legacy because that would be delaying whatever juiciness you can get out of life at the moment. I'd rather I'd rather leave a legacy at the moment than leave it leave a legacy for when I'm gone. So, what would you say is your legacy? So, what is the impact that you're having right now? The impact that I'm having, well, uh, first of all, is that I'm having a lot of fun at whatever I do. Yeah. Hopefully not irritating and pissing off too many people uh, <laughs> with it. And uh, yeah, uh, um, I, I would hope that I um, that I make it better for people uh, around me in what I do. That I make it better for my clients. That I help my clients uh, um, meet their goals of understanding legislation. Of, uh, of 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 avoiding uh, mistakes, I would hope that for my for my employees, I make things better because I help them realize their own goals and to uh, help them uh, become better professionals at what they do. So when I'm gone, they can continue doing what they are already doing, but maybe even better. For my partner in the firm, I would hope that I'm a good partner. Um, for my family, I hope I'm a good father and I'm a good husband. That's yeah, and for myself, I the legacy I I, I try to leave is to 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 live life fully and not yeah. regret anything. Do crazy stuff when I feel like doing crazy stuff, but not so much that it <laughs> that it really derails me too much. So so that's 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 been super interesting, um, Eric, and I've really enjoyed this conversation. I've learned a lot about you, actually. So I think uh, <laughs> I think a lot of people out there will have learned some really interesting things about you listening to this. Um, so everybody who's listening, don't forget to like, subscribe, comment below. Um, it's been fascinating. If you've got any questions, direct them to me or to Eric. If you're interested, if you're a unicorn with a golden triangle background, <laughs> contact Eric as well. Where Let can people know. find yes, you, please. by the way? Where can they find you? Uh, well, they can they can find uh, find me via the website of my firm, of course, uh, axon axon uh, lawyers dot com, or via my blog uh, medical devices legal dot com. And if they just type in my name in Google, it's I'm really really easy to find. So. Uh, Super. Well, listen, thank you so much for your time, Eric. And thank you, everybody else. And I'll be back soon with another episode of Career Diaries in MedTech. Thank you. Bye.